Hi Cardinals, it's Dr. Brown. I'm going to be continuing the one and only Ivan um, with our week one uh, read aloud. Um, I'm beginning on page 11. The littlest big top on earth. My neighbors here at the Big Top Mall know many tricks. They are an educated lot, more accomplished than I am. One of my neighbors plays baseball, although she is a chicken. Another drives a fire truck, although he is a rabbit. I used to have a neighbor, a sleek and thoughtful seal, who could balance a ball on her nose from dawn till dusk. Her voice was like the throaty bark of a dog chained outside on a cold night. Children wished on pennies and tossed them into her plastic pool. They glowed at the bottom like flat copper stones. The seal was hungry one day, or bored perhaps. So she ate 100 pennies. Max said she'd be fine. He was mistaken. Matt calls our show the littlest big top on earth. Every day at two, four, and seven, humans fan themselves, drink sodas, applaud. Babies wail. Mac, dressed like a clown, pedals a tiny bike. A dog named Snickers rides on Stella's back. Stella sits on a stool. It is a very sturdy stool. I don't do any tricks. Max, Max says it's enough for me to be me. Stella told me that some circuses move from town to town. They have humans who dangle on ropes, tw twining from the tops of tents, or twinning from the tops of tents. They have grumbling lions with gleaming teeth and a, a snaking line of elephants, each clutching the limp tail in front of her. The elephants look far off into the distance so they won't see the humans who want to see them. Our circus doesn't migrate. We sit there, or we sit where we are, like an old beast too tired to push on. After our show, humans forge through the stores. A store is where humans buy things they need to survive. At the Big Top Mall, some stores sell new things like balloons and t-shirts and caps cover the gleaming heads of humans. Some stores sell old things, things that smell dusty and damp and long forgotten. All day I watch humans scurry from store to store. They pass their green paper dry as old leaves and smelling of a thousand hands back and forth and back again. They're talking about money. They hunt frantically, stalking, pushing, grumbling. Then they leave, clutching bags filled with other things, bright things, soft things, big things. No matter how full the bags, they always come back for more. Humans are clever indeed. They spin pink clouds you can eat. They build domains with flat waterfalls, but they're lousy hunters. Gone. Some, some animals live privately, unwatched, but that is not my life. My life is flashing lights and pointing fingers and uninvited visitors. Inches away, humans flatten their hands against the wall of glass that separates us. The glass says you are this and we are that and that is how it will always be. Humans leave their fingerprints, fingerprints behind, sticky with candy, slick with, with sweat. Each night a weary human comes to swipe them away. Sometimes I press my nose against the glass. My nose print, like your fingerprint, is the first and last and only one. The man wipes the glass and then I'm gone. Artists. Here in my domain, I do not have much to do. You can only throw so many balls at humans before you get bored. A me ball is made by rolling up dung until it's the size of a small apple, then letting it dry. I always keep a few on hand. I hope you reread that because this is kind of funny. 
For some reason, my visitors never seem to carry any. In my domain, I have a tire swing, a baseball, a tiny plastic pool filled with dirty water, and even an old TV. I have a stuffed toy gorilla too. Julia, the daughter of the weary man who cleans the mall each night, gave it to me. The gorilla has empty eyes and floppy limbs, but I sleep with it every night. It's called Not Tag. Tag was my twin sister's name. Julia is 10 years old. She has hair like black glass and a wide half moon smile. She and I have a lot in common. We are both great apes. We are both artists. It was Julia who gave me my first crown, a stubby blue one slipped through the broken spot in my glass along with a folded piece of paper. I knew what to do with it. I w I'd watch Julia draw. When, she, when I dragged the crown across the paper, it left a trail in its wake like a slithering blue snake. Julia's drawings are wild with color and movement. She draws things that aren't real, clouds that smile and cars that swim. She draws until her crowns break and her paper rips. Her pictures are like pieces of a dream. I can't draw dreamy pictures. I never remember my dreams, although I sometimes awaken with my fists clenched and my heart hammering. My drawings seem pale and timid next to Julia's. She draws the ideas in her head and I draw the things in my cage. Simple items that fill my days. An apple core, a banana peel, a candy wrapper. I often eat my subjects before I draw them. And even though I draw the same things over and over again, I never get bored with my art. When I'm drawing, that's all I think about. I don't know about, I don't think about where I am, about yesterday or, or tomorrow. I just move my crowns across the paper. Humans don't always recognize, seem to recognize that I, what I've drawn, they squint, cock their heads, murmur, I'll draw a banana, a perfectly lovely banana, and they'll say, it's a yellow airplane, or it's a duck without wings. <sighs> that's right, I'm not drawing for them, or sorry, that's all right, I'm not drawing for them. I'm drawing for me. Max soon realized that people will pay for a picture made by a gorilla, even if they don't know what it is. Now I draw every day. My works sell for $20 a piece, 25 with a frame, at the gift shop near my domain. If I got, get tired and need a break, I eat my crowns. Shapes and clouds. I think I've always been an artist. Even as a baby still clinging to my mother, I had an artist's eye. I saw shapes in the clouds and sculptures in the tumbled stones at the bottom of a stream. I grabbed at colors, the crimson flower just out of reach, the ebony birds streaking past. I don't remember much about my early life, but I do remember this. Whenever I got a chance, I would dip my fingers into cool mud and use my mother's back for a canvas. She was a patient soul, my mother. Imagination. Someday, I hope I can draw the way Julia draws, imagining worlds that don't yet exist. I know what mo most humans think. They think gorillas don't have imaginations. They think we don't remember our pasts or ponder our futures. Come to think of it, I suppose they have a point. Mostly I think about what is, not what could be. I've learned not to get my hopes up. The loneliest gorilla in the world. When the big top mall was first built, it smelled of new paint and fresh hay, and humans came to visit from morning till night. They drifted past my domain like logs on a lazy river. Lately, a day may go by without a single visitor. Max says he's worried. He says, I'm not cute anymore. He says, Ivan, you've lost your magic, old guy. You used to be a hit. 
and it's true that some of my visitors don't linger the way they used to. They stare through the glass, they cluck their tongues, they frown while I watch my TV. He looks lonely, they say. Not long ago, a little boy stood before my glass, tears streaming down his smooth red cheeks. He must be the loneliest gorilla in the world, he said, clutching his mother's hand. At times like that, I wish humans could understand me the way I can understand them. It's not so bad, I wanted to tell the little boy. With enough time, you can get used to almost everything. TV. My visitors are often surprised when they see the TV Mac pit in my, my domain. They seem to find it odd the sight of a gorilla staring at tiny humans in a box. Sometimes, sometimes I wonder though, isn't the way they stare at me sitting in my tiny box just as strange? My TV is old. It doesn't always work and sometimes days will go by before anyone remembers to turn it on. I'll watch anything, but I'm particularly fond of cartoons with their bright, their bright jungle colors. I especially enjoy it when some clips, when someone slips on a banana peel. Bob, my dog friend, loves TV as almost as much as I do. He prefers to watch professional bowling and cat food commercials. Bob and I see have seen many romance movies too, in many romance movies too. In romance, there is much hugging and sometimes face licking. I have yet to see a single romance starring a gorilla. We also enjoy old Western movies. In a Western, someone said, always says, this town ain't big enough for the both of us, Sheriff. In a Western, you can tell who the good guys are and who the bad guys are, and the good guys always win. Bob says Westerns are nothing like real life. The Nature Show. I've been in my domain for 9,855 days alone. For a while, when I was a young and fool, when I was young and foolish, I thought I was the last gorilla on earth. I tried not to dwell on it. Still, it's hard to stay upbeat when you think there is no more of you. Then one night, after I watched a movie about men in black hats with guns and feeble-minded horses, a different show came on. It was not a cartoon, not a romance, not a western. I saw a lush forest. I heard birds murmuring, the grass moved, the trees rustled. Then I saw him. He was a threadbare, he was a, he was bit threadbare and scrawny and not as good looking as I am, to be honest. But sure enough, he was a gorilla. As suddenly as he appeared, the gorilla vanished and in his place was a scruffy white animal called, I learned, a polar bear. And then a chubby water creature called a manatee. And then another animal and another. All night long, I sat wondering about the gorilla I'd glimpsed. Where did he live? Would he ever come to visit? If there was a he somewhere, could there be a she as well? Or was it just the two of us in all of the world trapped in our own separate boxes? Stella. Stella says she is sure I will see another real live gorilla someday. And I believe her because she is even older than I am and has eyes like black stars and knows more than I will ever know. Stella is a mountain. Next to her, I am a rock, and Bob is a grain of sand. Every night when the stores close and the moon washes the world like milky light, Stella and I talk. We don't have much in common, and we, but we have enough. We are huge and alone, and we both love yogurt raisins. 
Sometimes Stella tells stories of her childhood, of leafy canopies hidden by mist and the busy songs of flowering water. Unlike me, she recalls every detail of her past. Stella loves the moon and it is with its untroubled smile. I love the feel of the sun on my belly. She says, it is quite a belly for me. It is quite a belly, my friend. And I say, thank you. And so is yours. We talk, but not too much. Elephants like gorillas do not waste words. Stella used to perform in a large and famous circus, and she still does some of those tricks for our show. During one stunt, Stella stands on her hind legs while Snickers jumps on her head. It's hard to stand on your hind legs when you weigh more than 40 men. If you are a circus elephant and you stand on your hind legs while a dog jumps on your head, you get a treat. If you do not, the claw stick comes swinging. Elephant hide is thick as bark, is thick as bark on an ancient tree, but a claw stick can pierce like it pierce it like a leaf. Once Stella saw a trainer hit a bull elephant with a claw stick. A bull is like a silverback, noble, contained, calm like a cobra is calm. When the claw stick caught the bull's flesh, he tossed the trainer in the air with his tusk. The man flew, Stella said, like an ugly bird. She never saw the bull again. Stella's trunk. Stella's trunk is a miracle. She can pick up a single peanut with elegant precision, tickling, tickle a passing mouse, tap the shoulder of a dozing keeper. Her trunk is remarkable, but still it can't unlatch the door of her tumble down domain. Circling Stella's legs are long ago scars from the chain she wore as a youth. Her bracelets, she calls them. When she worked at the famous circus, Stella had to balance on a pedestal for her most, dif her most difficult trick. One day she fell off and injured her foot. When she went lame and lagged behind the other elephants, the circus sold her to Mac. Stella's foot never healed completely. She limps when she walks. She sometimes, and sometimes her foot gets infected when she stands in one place for too long. Last winter, Stella's foot swelled to twice its normal size. She had a fever and she lay on the damp, cold floor of her domain for five days. They were very long days. Even now, I'm not sure she, she's completely better. She never complains though. It's hard to know. At the big top mall, no one bothers with iron shackles. A bristly rope tied to a bolt in the floor is all that's required. They think I'm too old to cause trouble, Stella says. Old age, she says, is a powerful disguise. A plan. It's been two days since anyone's come to visit. Mac is in a bad mood. He says we're losing money hand over fist. He said he says he's going to sell the whole lot of us. When Thelma, a blue and yellow macaw, stand, or demands, kiss me, big boy, for the third time in 10 minutes. Mac throws a soda can at her. Thelma's wings are clipped so she can't fly, but she still can hop. She leaps aside in the nick of time. Pucker up, she says in a shrill whistle. Mac stomps off to his office and slams the door shut. I wonder if my visitors have grown tired of me. Maybe if I learn a trick or two, it will help. Humans do seem to enjoy watching me eat. Luckily, I'm always hungry. I'm a gifted e eater. I'm a gifted eater. A silver black, silver back must eat 45 pounds of food a day if he wants to be a silver back. 45 pounds of fruit and leaves 
and seeds and stems and bark and vines and rotten wood. Also, I enjoy the occasional insect. I'm going to try to eat more. Maybe then we will get more visitors. Tomorrow, I will eat 50 pounds of food, maybe even 55. That should make Matt happy. Will it really? Food costs money. Bob. I explain my plan to Bob. Ivan, he says, trust me on this one. The problem is not your appetite. He hops onto my chest and licks my chin, checking for leftovers. Bob is a stray, which means he doesn't have a permanent address. He's also so speedy, so wily, that mall workers long ago gave up trying to catch him. Pop Bob can sneak into cracks and crevices, but like a tracked rat. He lives well off the ends of hot dogs he pulls from the trash. For dessert, he laps up spilled lemonade and splattered ice cream cones. I've tried to share my food with Bob, but he's a picky eater and says he prefers to hunt for himself. Bob is tiny, wiry, and fast like a barking squirrel. He is even nut-colored and big-eared. His tail moves like weeds in the wind, spiraling and dancing. Bob's tail makes me dizzy and confused. It has meanings within meanings, like human words. I'm sad, it says. I'm happy, it says. Beware, I might be tiny, but my teeth are sharp. Gorillas don't have any use for tails. Our feelings are uncomplicated. Our rumps are unadored, unadored, adorned. Bob used to have three brothers and two sisters. Humans tossed them out of a truck onto a freeway. When they were five, a few weeks old, Bob rolled into a ditch. The others did not. His first night on the highway, Bob slept in the icy mud of the ditch. When he woke, he was so cold that his legs would not bend for an hour. The next night, Bob slept under some dirty hay near the big mall garbage bins. The following night, Bob found the spot in the corner of my domain where the glass is broken. I dreamed that I had eaten a furry donut, and when I woke in the dark, I discovered a tiny puppy snoring on top of my belly. It had been so long, I felt the comfort of any another's warmth that I wasn't sure what to do. Not that I hadn't had visitors. Mac had been in my domain, of course, but many other and many other keepers. I'd seen my share of rats zip past and the occasional wayward sparrow and fluttered in through a hole in my ceiling. But they never stayed long. I didn't move all night for fear of waking Bob. Wild. Once I asked Bob why he didn't want a home, humans, I'd noticed, seemed to be irrationally fond of dog fond of dogs, and I could see why a puppy would be easier to cuddle with than say a gorilla. Everywhere is my home, Bob answered. I'm a wild beast, my friend, untamed and undaunted. I told Bob he could work in the shows like Snickers, the poodle who rides Stella. Bob said Snickers sleeps on a pink pillow in Mac's office. He said he eats foul-smelling meat from a can. He made a face, his lips curled, revealing tiny needles of teeth. Poodles, he said, are parasites. Picasso. Mac gives me a fresh crown, a yellow one, and ten pieces of paper. Time to earn your keep, Picasso, he mutters. I wonder who this Picasso is. Does he have a tire swing like me? Does he ever eat his crowns? I know I have lost my magic, so I try my very best. I clutch the crown and think. I scan my, my domain. What's yellow? A banana. I draw a banana. The paper tears, but only a little. I lean back and Mac picks up the drawing. Another day, another scribble, he 
he says. One down, nine to go. What else is yellow? I wonder, scanning my domain. I draw another banana, and then I draw eight more. Three visitors. Three visitors are here. A woman, a boy, a girl. I strut across my domain for them. I dangle from my tire swing. I eat three banana peels in a row. The boy spits at my window. The girl throws a handful of pebbles. Sometimes I'm glad the glass is there. My visitors return. After the show, the spit pebble children come back. I display my impressive teeth. I splash in my filthy pool. I grunt and hoot and I eat and I eat and I eat some more. The children pound their pathetic chests. They toss more pebbles. Slimy chimps, I mutter. I throw a me ball at them. Sometimes I wish the glass were not there. That is all for this week. Um, you're going to have to tune in or check out the other YouTube video for the next reading. Hopefully you're enjoying the one and only Ivan and are enjoying it with your family. Have a great day.